So, um, you know, there's all these different plant-based doctors and they all have variations of what you should do, how much you should do in supplementation. Some say, don't worry about supplementation other than B12. Others are suggest yeah. supplementation, you know, ad nauseum. Um, is there anyone that you think is, ha, whose protocol has been verified by, by their outcomes? And um, are we getting lost in the details when we should be focusing on the whole food plant-based part? And then the other, the other things are just more tweaking or are those dramatically important? Yeah. You know, um, I'm, I've been formally educated in supplements. I spend a few hours a week reading medical literature on supplements. I don't have my own supplement line that may change, but at this point I don't. Um, I use supplements, but I have to chuckle. I listened to a podcast this week on the topic of treating high blood pressure naturally. And the doctor being interviewed, he was a naturopathic doc and they're wonderful people. But he was talking about people leaving the office with like 14 new vitamins on the first visit. I won't do that. Uh, number, uh, my, I insist that generally there has to be science behind the supplement. So I showed aged garlic supplements. There's 10 studies, 20 studies, 30 studies in humans of advantages to blood pressure, cholesterol, homocysteine levels, and actually to plaque. So I use that in almost every patient. So I actually think with all humility, I have the most advanced protocol for supplements because the first questioner mentioned a couple and I'm very familiar with them and they're available, but I need to see a study before I'm gonna ask you to spend a hundred dollars a month or maybe buy two supplements that are each a hundred dollars a month. I mean, those costs add up. So I'm sticking to a few that have science. I'd rather you be consistent and take them. So you mentioned this naturopath suggesting 14 new supplements. And while they can point to research for this supplement working on this specific you know, issue and th that supplement working on another issue, how do we how do we deal with the risks of contraindications between a mix of 14 different mm -hmm. supplements when you know the research hasn't been done because we can't even get, you know, the most basic research studies mm -hmm. done? Yeah, you know, and there is some risk to that. Um, people genetically are different and metabolize different and absorb differently. Um, you know, people take vitamin D and don't have good blood levels and people take vitamin D and do, and there's differences in absorption and receptor density and all. So it gets very complex. And the other factor is, and I see it all the time, people get pill fatigue, you know, and if you can get them on one or two necessary prescription drugs, these are real heart patients and one or two or three supplements. And then they're probably going to be taking a baby aspirin a day. Some people take a natural blood thinner called natokinase rather than a baby aspirin a day. You know, if it's six to eight pills a day, they may be compliant long-term, but I see people all the time, they were taking 30 vitamins and they just give up and they take breaks and, you know, that's suboptimal. So I think you have to be real life reasonable too. The other thing is, you know, many of the drugs are generic and cost, you know, pennies a day. Aspirin is pennies a day when indicated. Not everybody needs aspirin. You know, you can make a $500 a month supplement bill very easily. And that's just not sustainable for most people. So you mentioned baby aspirin. What's the latest research on baby aspirin? I believe there was some research that came out yeah. that suggested it may not be as safe or there may be problems with with. Maybe aspirin. Maybe good question. Maybe three answers. Until 2018, there was an old school um, uh, practice. You know, Joe or Jane, if you take a baby aspirin a day, you'll lower your risk of stroke or heart attack. Just add it in. Maybe their cholesterol was up. Maybe their blood sugar was up. In 2018, three very large studies, I think they included total about 40,000 patients were randomized, these are healthy people without heart attack, to aspirin or placebo. And none of the three convincingly showed that a baby aspirin a day added to a general program had a convincing risk reduction. Or if they did lower risk, there was a GI bleed risk that was almost the same. So there were all kinds of headlines and they still show up now and then. Um, very importantly, those three studies excluded people with stents, 
bypass heart attacks because we never question whether they should be on aspirin and we still believe they should be on aspirin. So now we are in 2024 and since 2018, two very large studies have been published that if you get that coronary artery calcium test and if the results are over 100 abnormal, you can show a benefit on average by taking a baby aspirin a day. And that's what I tell my patients with the high calcium scores get back on aspirin, the studies do suggest it. We don't have specifically data what to do with that artificial intelligence coronary CT angiogram. But if there's a lot of soft plaque, if they're a stage two or higher patient, I'll put them on baby aspirin. The final answer is uh, one new group. There's a, a study about 2021 and a study just in the last month that if you've inherited a high level of lipoprotein little a, more than 125 nanomoles per liter. So we're talking, you know, 15 to 20% of the population. Taking a baby aspirin a day may help prevent stroke and heart attack. So that's something new. I wasn't doing that before. And if people say, well, I'd rather take natokinase, which is a little bit more expensive vitamin that thins the blood, I'll, I'll work with them with that. But I'm going to ask them to take something. How do you respond to critics who argue that moderate consumption of animal products is not harmful to the heart? Well, it's harmful to the animal and it's harmful to the environment. We got lots of data, but this question comes up, doc, two eggs a week. I mean, you know, uh, it's what John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods and a plant-based advocate says, you know, it'd be very hard to show that a 90% plus plant-based diet and a hundred percent plant-based diet have a seriously different outcome on people because so few people eat that well already. That would be such a great advance. I think the sicker you are, you know, the heavier you are, the more your blood sugar is an issue, blood pressure is an issue, inflammation is an issue, sleep apnea is an issue, and heart disease is an issue. The more uh, the 100% um, goal is important. And the second thing is human nature. Uh, it's people that are creeping. They creep away from taking their vitamins. They creep away from taking their prescription drugs and they creep away. They get all excited when they watch Forks Over Knives as an example. You know, in the year follow up, yeah, I added back some fish and a little chicken and then I really get what they're eating. And they told me they were plant based and, you know, maybe it's better than they started, but boy, have they wandered. So, you know, I find it easier. And again, I've been doing whole food plant based for 45 plus years, strictly 100 percent, never an animal product. It's just easier. The rules are so clear cut, you know, and the availability of food is so wide that. Nobody's going hungry being 100% plant-based. And on that point, with regard to it being easier, I heard an expression with regard to addiction that 99% is hard, 100% is easy. So Yeah, I, I generally agree with that. You know, one drink can get a person back, one cigarette can get a person back, and one crispy cream donut, man, that can, you know, particularly for a food-addicted, sugar-addicted person, so... Um, I, I do find, I often say, be extreme in diet, moderate in exercise, and abundant in love. That's my own little triad there. So take that home. So with people who are food addicted, which I think is probably most people in, in the United States, um, should we look at ourselves like alcoholics look at themselves, that somebody who stopped drinking for 20 years is still an alcoholic, and if they have a drink, it's dangerous so if somebody who had, you know, unhealthy practices and really overconsumed food uncontrollably and they've been good for a long period of time, they should really avoid that Krispy Kreme donut or, or you know, any any product like that because they're still a foodaholic. Yeah, it, well, you know, there's a subset that that's definitely true. I mean, I have patients and friends that sugar is their nemesis and it has to be a 100 percent rule and it can be 10 years later. And, you know, it's probably different when you talk about, you know, drinking a liter of vodka versus having three or four Krispy Kremes, but that may trigger them, you know, to really slide. And, uh, you know, it's an addicted brain and uh, they're going to have to go through the whole process of withdrawal again. So, you know, they know their guidelines and they're very careful about it. It's sort of like a celiac patient, you know, they're not casual about gluten. They know they're going to have diarrhea and bloody diarrhea, so they're strict and um, you know, you, in, or a not allergic patient. There's plenty of people out there being 100% compliant. So yes, and the other problem is we cut out and cure prostate cancer 
we're not cutting out and curing atherosclerosis. So 20 years later, they've got more atherosclerosis than they had 20 years earlier. And it's just as important, you know, I really insist on my patients. I have a lot of them, but I got to see them at least once a year. I got to, you know, remind them with either a baseball bat or, you know, a loving hand that this is a long haul. And, you know, they don't want to be a demented 86-year-old and nutrition and fitness is part of dementia, just like it's part of our disease. Thank you. I'm going to throw it to the audience. Uh, Joe L., please state where you're from and ask your question. Yeah, Huntington, Long Island. Um, I have three quick questions, but you can take your time because I did subscribe so I can go back to the reruns. And I advise everybody to subscribe to the uh, to the reruns of the conference. Um, my first question is, would calcium, um, uh, a calcium deposit in my kidney show up in a calcium test? My second question is, um, I grow uh, vegetables and I have quite a bit of uh, garlic in the ground this year and they're doing great. Um, how do you suggest I age garlic? Because I love what you said about, you know, some of the studies on aged garlic and blood pressure. And the last thing is, I have two beautiful kids in their 30s, um, early 30s, and they're both um, outstanding and successful sports trainers. And they're obsessed with animal products on a daily, minute by minute basis. Wow. And I need to stop talking about it and get them in a doctor and get them tests. What tests do you advise young people to do right. to be able to wake them up to what's happening? Okay, real quick. First question is a real good one. Um, you can have a CT scan of your abdomen for a kidney stone, and the report may mention uh, calcification of your blood vessels. That is a big clue everybody ignores, don't ignore it. I always read the report. It's one little line in a long report. I want to know. Number two, a lot of people get a chest CT scan for pneumonia, for a cough, uh, for fluid. They'll often mention that the aorta and the heart arteries are calcified, just as a comment. Don't ignore that. Read the study. And if the radiologist doesn't mention it, I'll tell the patient, get me a copy of that CD and I'll look at it and we get free information. But more and more radiologists do mention it and they should mention it. Um, and then even the dentists are doing x-rays of the mouth and they'll send me a patient. They see calcium in the carotid artery. So it's a disease wide. You can have a CT, you can have an x-ray or a CT of your knee because you twisted it and the blood vessels are calcified. They're all clues. They're all disease and shouldn't be ignored. Number two, you're going to have to look up online. Uh, how long do you leave a bulb of garlic out? I, I believe when we're talking about these tablets, it's two years. So it's a long process. And whether that's practical or not, I don't know. And uh, the third is, um, you know, have your kids read a book like Plant-Based Athletes by Matthew Frazier and Robert Cheek. Great book. And, you know, blood tests. They should know their fasting cholesterol, their fasting blood sugar, their C-reactive protein. They should know their lipoprotein little a. A lot of people are doing, the, you know, this terrible animal plant, animal-based diet because there are doctors out there saying if you want to build muscle, you have to eat flesh and eat muscle. And it's crazy data. I mean, you can do it with edamame and lentils, um, but their cholesterol may be sky high. Uh, again, this young 39-year-old I saw on Thursday, that was his, the keto diet, because he's an athlete, his cholesterol is crazy. I gave him a four-week plant-based diet and challenge, and I was surprised. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to see if I can drop my numbers. I don't want to be on a drug. So, uh, you know, get them tested. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, and for people who are interested, um, we had a speaker named uh, Derek Treesize. Tree yeah, great guy, Derek Treesize. Yep. And he's a professional, he's a trainer and a professional bodybuilder, plant-based and, and tested multiple times for competitions that he's all natural. Uh, he's got a tremendous amount of, of muscle and uh, he can speak to uh, and had to speak to that idea of putting muscle on as a plant-based athlete. So uh, the next question is coming from Janet M. Please state where you're from and ask your question, Janet. 
Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Tom. First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm from Maryland. What I wanted to know is of all your books or articles or pamphlets, like, is there one that kind of concisely in a few pages would have the different tests that you're talking about and sort of the progression of tests? Like if you have a high calcium score, then go to this test and also that would list the supplements like something just concise in a few pages that one could get buy from you? Yeah, well, I actually give it away for free. Um, yeah, on my clinic website, con, K A H N, longevitycenter.com, there's a button for blogs, articles. And I write an article every week. And um, in about July 2023, I just doing it from memory. I have a blog called, What Do I Do About My High Calcium Score? And it's the longest blog I've written. It's maybe eight pages, but it literally has step-by-step -step what to do. And there are links to the research articles. Because as I said, if the science isn't there, I'm guessing, and I don't want to guess with my patients. Thank you. And um, we've got about three minutes left. So in the, the beginning of the presentation, you started with the idea that people seem to be focused on the wrong things based on their search. We know what the number one killer is in the United States, and yet cancer has a much higher um, search rate. Um, in trying to understand w why that might be, I'm, I'm curious, how much money is made in the treatment of heart disease versus yeah. the amount of money made in the treatment of cancer? Yeah, that's a good question. Much more with cancer, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying it's unnecessary, but there are chemotherapy drugs that are tens of thousands of dollars a month. You know, if you have a bypass surgery or a stent, you're going to get a hospital bill for tens of thousands of dollars. Hopefully your insurance will cover most of it. But, you know, right now, our most expensive cardiac drug is about $700 a month, $800 a month. And, you know, it's a big struggle for a lot of people if we can't get insurance coverage. Uh, we're nowhere near like uh, cancer. So is it true that some of the reason it's being driven by the pharmaceutical industry because it's so lucrative in the oncology world? Yeah, I think that's likely and true. Nobody promotes the doctor's lifestyle and diet and fitness and generics and supplements um, and sleep therapy because it's a loser. Calcium scoring is a loser. Do you think anybody makes money on a $75 CT scan? And there's a little money to be made on the $1,500 coronary CT angiogram. But the good news is we can actually get a lot done at a low cost. So uh, that's why I can get most of my patients. You know, I, I all tell them, you're getting the same test Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos get, and they'd pay the same amount, but you can have the same care. Thank you. So we've got about a minute left. Uh, if you could leave us with uh, with any final thoughts for the audience, and uh, I'd like to leave on a on a positive note on on how you see the future unfolding. Yeah, I think the current way we treat cardiology patients is so exciting. This is my thirty fifth year in practice. I could retire. I'm so excited. I'm not. Uh, I get fired up. You know, working with people. Uh, we've opened this door of visibility of you know, staging you in this war against heart cancer and fighting it. And maybe you don't have it at all, which is also the good news. So, you know, just don't assume that you're healthy because you look good on the outside. I hope you are, but let's find out and let's uh, have a conversation in five years where we've seen heart disease drop, certainly in this audience, hopefully across the entire United States. Great. Thank you for all the information you share with us today, doctor. If we could unmute the audience, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. You're the best. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my God.